Well, welcome back, everyone. We are delighted to be welcoming Don Adis um, from across the ocean on another continent. Um, Don, thank you so very much uh, for being with us. P the barbarians are banging at the gate to come in to hear you. Oh, great, come on in. Um, and it, it is really a pleasure to welcome you. Um, I know that Don's uh, reputation um, precedes her wide and far. Uh, Don is the Emeritus Professor in the School of Philosophy and Art History at the University of Essex. Um, it would take many hours um, to do justice um, to all that Don has done for the field. So I will refer you to the brief biography that we circulated previously. Um, but suffice it to say, we are delighted that Don's scholarship on Mina Loy um, has been captured uh, in the catalog that Jennifer uh, edited for us. I hope that you will have an opportunity to dive into her essay, From, from Rogue to Rags, Mina Loy's Constructions. And Don, we are so pleased that you can be with us virtually today. We hope we can find a time to bring you across the Atlantic to see the exhibition in person. Um, but it was fun having a virtual tour with you recently. And now, without further ado, let me pass um, symbolically the baton to you. Thank you so much, Anne, uh, for that lovely introduction. I've got no idea uh, whether you can see me or not, everyone. I, I hope you can hear me. You can see me OK. And um, I, I look, I, I'm really sorry that I cannot be here, cannot be with you in person. And I very much hope that I will have an opportunity to see the ex exhibition, which Anne took me around on a virtual tour and is quite stunning. So many regrets that I can't be with you, um, but I very much look forward to meeting you all virtually. And I just must say that I am really, I, I feel enormously privileged to be part of the catalogue of the exhibition. Uh, with the essays by uh, Roger, Jennifer Gross, and Anne Lauterbach. And I just want to very briefly refer to Roger's essay, which I think, think is the most wonderful celebration and introduction to Mina Loy. Um, both two points, really. One, that she shouldn't be or can't be pigeonholed. She can't be actually attached to any of the isms by which we're you know, sometimes used to talking about modern art. Uh, but also that it's as though we're finally catching up with her ourselves, as though finally, you know, she's been so far ahead, we are beginning to get there and beginning to get some sort of sense of what it was all about, complicated as it is. And I was very much struck today by looking at the new list of Turner Prize nominees. I don't know if you're aware of the Turner Prize in, in England, but it's the sort of biggest prize for contemporary art, and it, it, it tries to be controversial. And the description of, the, of one of the artists who's been included, Jessie Darling, it just struck me that it was not out of place in relation to Mina Loy. Uh, Jessie Darling makes sculptures and installations that evoke the vulnerability of the human body and the precariousness of power structures. The Turner Prize jury was struck by the artist's ability to manipulate materials in ways that skillfully express the messy reality of life and expose the world's underlying fragility. So that's just to say, you know, hello, <laughs> people are finally catching up with Mina Loy. Um, now, I, I'm going to talk quite briefly, really, um, to the essay that I wrote for the catalogue. I'm hoping that I can make this work. Can you all see yes. the cover of, of, of the little magazine Rogue? Yes. Thanks. Good. OK. Uh, just very briefly to, to, to say a little bit about how it all began for me in, in terms of the interest in research on Mina Loy. I was in New York in 2019 uh, as one of the um distinguished fellows, and my primary object of research was to look at the little magazine Rogue, which is extraordinarily difficult to find. I mean, I just wanted to see it physically, uh, completely. Um, but it became clear that Mina Loy, as I did manage to find it, was a really very important part of it. Um, but 
coinciding with that research on rogue, I saw an exhibition at Francis Naumann's gallery, which included a number of the artists associated with the Ehrensberg Circle and the, uh, the, the Duchamp links there. And there was this work, which there was actually shown horizontally, uh, though we now know from Berenice Abbott's photographs that it should be vertical, which of course is communal pots. And I'd never seen this before. I'd never seen actually any of Minaloy's late work, certainly none of, none of the constructions. And I just, I just couldn't believe it. I'd never, really never seen anything like it. I couldn't sort of get, get, my, get my head around it. So I really wanted to understand it. And then realizing it was by Minaloy and um, hanging very close to it, were these wonderful portraits, the self-portrait de Mon Miroir, and this Stephen Hoyce uh, Mina Loy photograph, extraordinarily beautiful, very Edwardian woman. Uh, and I, I wanted to understand what had happened, how, how she had gone from this person that who also figured so largely in, uh, in Rogue, um, and ended up with these extraordinary uh, objects, constructions, constructed from the label insisted on, the label in the exhibition at Francis Darman's gallery, insisting on the fact that it was made from rags. So the, the, the title of my essay was From Rogue to Rags. I liked the alliteration. Um, but in revisiting it, which is what I was invited to do for this talk, I would like to somewhat revise what was the implication of that, that, uh, of that title. Um, before I do that, I mean, I don't want to talk myself for too long because I do want to engage in, in discussion and debate with all of you. But I would, I would just like to say a little bit about uh, Mina Loy's contribution to Rogue. It, 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 this, is, this is really what is already in the essay, so I won't go into it in any great detail. But uh, the first drawing that was reproduced by Minaloy uh, in, in, in the United States uh, was in Rogue in 1916. Um, this wonderful, very Aubrey Beardsley, a sort of um, Au Nouveau, not Au Nouveau, but Aubrey Beardsley style drawing called Consider Your Grandmother's Stays. And of course, stays are corsets. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I, I, I elaborated in, in the essay on the, the possible connection with her mother. Um, I just mentioned this lovely watercolor, uh, the uh, love coddled by beautiful ladies, um, because it was actually quite startling at the time, quite shocking when it was shown in her 1912 exhibition in London, and it was also shown in Paris, uh, the very directness of the sexuality. And I, I, I just wanted to quote something that Roger um, highlights as what really first sort of sucked him into Nina Loy's territory. This phrase from one of the love um, poems, the early ones, Pig Cupid, his rosy snout rooting erotic garbage. And there's a real contrast in a way between between the, the, the sort of uh, apparent elegance but forthrightness of this watercolour and uh, that, that extraordinarily direct, um, very erotic and at the time extremely challenging poem, which very much shocked the audience in the States when it was, when it was uh, published in others. Um, so the, the drawing, uh, Consider Your Grandmother's Stays, was reproduced in Rogue in, in 1916 uh, with an article by uh, her great friend um, Louise Norton, who was also uh, published in Rogue as Dame Rogue, très décorsetée, very, very uncorseted, philosophic, in her um, regular column called Philosophic Fashions. So it's about how women have resisted the corset uh, and, and want to be liberated and not stuck in their stays. Um, and I just suggested it might. I'd have a particularly personal connection for Miloy uh, because her mother, who you can see here, very corseted with Mina on the right, 
used to try to prevent Mina Loy from uh, practicing her poetry, her art, and so on. And she found it very challenging. Mina Loy clearly was already quite uh, quite a rebel in those terms. And whenever Mina Loy resisted her, she would faint, which is tended to be what happened if you if you were wearing too tight corsets. So there's a very personal link there for the for the corsets. Um, I talk a little bit in the essay about uh, about Mina Loy's connection with the Futurists and the way that Futurism, in a sense, liberated her in terms of words, although she seems not to have shown, as far as I can tell, uh, any interest in uh, visual Futurism. So Mina Loy arrived in New York. This, oh, this, this, sorry, this, this is a wonderful uh, um, spread from Rogue. Virgins plus curtains minus dots, which was illustrated by Clara Tice, uh, who was another of the of the women associated with the the New York group around the Arensberg Salon. Uh, of course, dots is not dots in the sense of decorative dots, but it's do, as in a marriage portion, which is what the bride was sold for. And this is, I think, linked to some of Mina Loy's early, very strong. Um, I would call it feminist writing. She read a feminist manifesto that wasn't published, uh, where she doesn't take a completely straightforward line about um, what women need to do to become independent and uh, liberated. But she says an important thing is not to actually rely upon virginity as the thing that you are sold for. So this poem is, is was extremely challenging at the time, virgins plus curtains minus dots, which is talking about this situation that women should confront. Um, okay. And just to say that um, I, I, I would I would like to expand on 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 uh, Mina Loy's role within you know, one of the most famous episodes. In, in the history of modern art, which is the fountain scandal with Marcel Duchamp. Uh, but I think there really isn't time. But I will just show you this one double, double page spread from Who's Who in Manhattan. Uh, and Who's Who are all women. And you can see Mina Loy is on the left hand page, right hand side of the left hand page, wearing a very high top hat. And uh, her friend Louise Norton is wearing a frilly skirt on the center of that page. But it, the, the, in a sense, the avant-garde was kind of dominated by women. And I think there is a, there is a very interesting story here behind the, uh, behind the history of, of Marcel Duchamp's fountain, um, which is partly to do with that. And this is a very brief, <laughs> very brief comment on it. Um, there, there is a there is a, a kind of caricature in Rogue um, of somebody called uh, Anthony Comstock, who was the who kind of who who worked for the, the, the Society for the Prevention of Vice. And anything that showed, I mean, nudity was impossible. But almost anything that showed an ankle was impossible for Comstock. Um, and there was an exhibition of Clara Tice's nudes, like the one on the right there. Uh, which Comstock tried to uh, prevent and to confiscate, uh, and he failed because um, Alan Norton bought all the things there. But Comstock was a sort of figure. So, so this this kind of the Society for the Prevention of of, of Vice included any references to um, to sanitation, basically, and so a urinal would have been absolutely in the foreground of something to be suppressed uh, by Comstock. And I think that is not entirely incidental um, in terms of the uh, the story of course of Fountain, um, which is shown here in the second issue of the Blind Man, uh, which an issue which also included um, there's Mina Loy as the Blind Man's Ball, which included uh, Mina Loy's own personal version of a ready-made Oh Marcel, otherwise I also have been to Louise's, which is apparently a compilation of a lot of conversations and phrases that she overheard at the blind man's wall. So I'm just, just saying that she was very much at, at, at the centre of and understood what was going on in terms of the most advanced right, kind of operations in terms of art at the time. Now, I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to 
race ahead now. I'm, I'm, I'm skipping over. So Rogue was, was the initial point of my interest in, in Mina Loy. Um, and then it was the question, I'm afraid I'm just not 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 really trying to um do the whole the whole story but my interest in the late constructions which came from seeing <laughs> at the gallery um and so coming back to my title from 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 uh rogue to rags and rereading my essay um i i realized that i'm i'm sort of trying to try to work against this title i'm i'm trying in the essay to to you know, uh, not to imply by that title that there was a kind of um, a collapse, you know, from from rogue and then and then you know, a disaster, a move towards dereliction. Um, and in trying to work against this in the essay, I, I I seem to be trying to insist that the materials she was working with were not necessarily in themselves squalid. And uh, uh, this, it reads rather oddly at the time. I'm, I'm saying like, well, of course, paper is not necessarily squalid, but but I, I'm kind of I missed the point actually. I think, uh, which is that what was, I, I think what she was in sense. Well, uh, sorry, something else. Uh, I, I'll quote Carolyn Burke made notes in her biography that there's a disturbing contrast between the delicate modelling. And the materials that are used, but I, I kind of feel this is not exactly a contrast. It's it's all built in to what really Mina seemed to be after in some sense. And I, what I feel is that she was reversing, or at least kind of throwing up in the air for discussion, conventional categories of opposites, such as high and low, noble and base elite and humble. Um, and, and I think in, in doing so, she is actually, you know, she, she is playing with the apparent sort of uh, um, nature of the detritus that she is fashioning uh, into a work of art. Um, so I, I, I think that it's, it's always Mina Loy's own words that best explain what one is trying to, try to talk about, um, especially in terms of the relationship with these late constructions, the poem Hot Cross Bum. Um, so I'm just going to quote part of it. So, wonder why defeat by dignity of the majority oft reveals in close-up of infernal face a nobler origin than practicalities elite. I think that is a that is a wonderful, wonderful phrase, practicalities elite. This, this, these are the, the people who are, who take a very practical view of the world, who are interested in, as it were, the nature of humanity or, or their spiritual expression. So they're totally practical. And those, those who become the elite there are those who really um, don't recognise the, uh, as it were, the, the kind of nobility in in those who are suffering. I'm not putting this very well. I'm sorry. This is, I've 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 had difficulty in, um, in in having enough time to develop the idea, but it's something along those lines. So this uh, extraordinary um, uh, this extraordinary work, the communal cot, uh, which is extraordinarily detailed too, um, and it, it has. You're looking at, at, at figures, human figures, who who seem to have, you know, who are who are who have fallen or lying on paving stones, and the scale is very small because the paving stones are obviously much larger. So we're sort of looking through both ends of a telescope, and very very detailed, like the the figure on the right, um, the bottom. Oh, sorry, top right there. Is it upside down? Yes, I think it was good. Um, so, so in a way, it, I, I, what I'm trying to say is that I think she's. I think the material itself is crucial. The fact that it, it is, yeah. it is, um, some it's been rejected. It's kind of squalid, and so on. But she is infusing that very material with nobility. 
Um, and, and again, it, it, there's a term that she, I think, is uses herself. So the materials are detritus. And whether or not it was because it was all she had, I think doesn't really matter. But it's the character of the materials that's crucial. They fit her subject, which is something she has been working towards for decades, making the material part of the whole thing, not just the medium representation. And here, I want quickly just to quote uh, 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 her description of Oetzer in Incel, the, the, um, the, the Swiss artist, where she makes a very telling comparison between infusing and portraying. She says, Incel is able to infuse an actual detail with the magical contrariness surrealism merely portrays. And the contrast I think is, is, is very interesting. I mean, one can go back to what that reveals of her attitude to surrealism. That's something else. But it's the idea of magical contrariness. It's not a bad way of describing the transformations in the constructions. So um, just very quickly, uh, look at some. And these... These are from the installation, the Bodley Exhibition, 1959, uh, which uh, was organised with, with the help of, among others, uh, Marcel Duchamp. Um, and really, two points I would like to, to raise, um, possibly three for, for possible discussion. Um, one is, of course, that, uh, that, that Duchamp, who wrote the tiny little uh, little introduction to the invitation, was himself working on something in low relief or high relief at the same time. So what he wrote for the invitation was, Mina's poems are deux et demi dimensions, haut relief and bas fond, ink. Marcel Duchamp, Admirable. <laughs> wonderful mixture of French and English, and he's making this contrast between high relief and lower depths, and, and high, high relief and low relief, and, and so on. Amoravit. Well, it must have actually, uh, there's the, the introduction. Um, I mean, nobody else, uh, or very few people I'm aware of, were working similarly in uh, low and high relief at the time. And of course, Duchamp's work in total secrecy. There's no, there's no way, there's no suggestion that uh, either of them were aware of at the time what the other was doing. At least, so far as I know, I mean, I don't know about Duchamp perhaps seeing Mina you know, Loy's works earlier, but I don't think there's a suggestion of influence here. Just that there was a parallel going on for interesting reasons, and I'll come back to in a second. Um, and. More of the, this, this, I think, is probably Mina and, and Duchamp um, and Hassani. So, um, one question that arises from that, uh, from the 1959 exhibition, is uh, why was she then not included in the very, very influential uh, and important exhibition, The Art of Assemblage, uh, Bill Seitz's uh, show at Museum of Modern Art in New York in 1961, which established a whole raft of, um, of artists and practices that it would seem she should have belonged to. But perhaps there are good reasons, or, or not good reasons necessarily, but reasons that she wasn't included. And that, that's a question that uh, I, I would like to pose and that we might actually come back to. And then, um, then I just want to briefly mention the other work that I've lucky enough to see physically because I haven't seen many of them physically and sadly of course can't come to the exhibition to see the ones that are there but I saw House Hunting in Venice which is a completely stunning work um, and there's a great deal one can say about that um, I mean from all sorts of points of view from the point of view of sort of woman as, as goddess woman as home woman as architecture and, and and so on, um, and Woman's series, the goddess. But one wonders wonder whether she was aware of Louise Bourgeois. I think probably not Louise Bourgeois was aware of her, where there were similar kind of parallels being drawn between the female body and architecture. Um, so I'm, I'm going to start 
there, actually, because I'd much rather, uh, I've probably gone on for too long, I'm sorry, I'd, I'd much rather engage in, in conversation and, and debate. Well, I just had one thing about the, uh, the, the Duchamp work, which is that when it was revealed after he died in 1968, it was immensely controversial and shocked most of his most loyal supporters. Because it was, in a sense, um, it, it was figurative. And I think one of the things that, that her constructions probably, uh, in, in a sense, uh, alienated the curator of the Out of Assemblage, one of those things was the fact that it did include figures and that it included social comment. Um, and th there was one critic, if I can find it, um, who commented um, about the Bodley Gallery exhibition, the alliance between Dada and social comment is downright sinister. And it, it was as though there was no way at that time for them to see objects, assemblages, ready-made things other than in a tradition of Dada and surrealism or in relation to very abstract forms of assemblage. The idea that there was a sort of social comment involved was actually very difficult. So um, I will I will leave it there and uh, hope there are some questions. Sorry to be rambling like this. Don, thank you so much for a fascinating and provocative presentation. And I'm sure that there will be a number of questions. Um, I'm happy to open it up to the floor. And again, if everybody can just be sensitive to directing their questions towards the speaker. Dawn, thank you so much for that wonderful um, overview. I have a question for you about um, influences and what she might have seen in if she was in New York and then in Aspen. Do you know if she had any connection or in uh, connections with uh, Walter Hopps in the Ferris Gallery, Ed Keenholz, and the LA group of assemblagists? Well, she was certainly a very close friend of Cornell. Um, and of course, he was, he was the person that Walter Hopps showed in Pasadena. Uh, I can't remember what date that was. Um, but, but, the, but I suppose the, the question would, I think she was aware of that. And she was certainly aware of Cornell, though I, though I suspect that if there was any influence, it was certainly two-way with Cornell. Um, whether there's anything more specific than that, I actually, I, I don't know, but, the, but there was, I mean, it's true Duchamp, there's certainly a connection also with, with Walter Hopps. Yeah. But you feel, I, I, it's, it's odd how, although there, I mean, I think there may be influence, I wouldn't want to rule, rule that out at all. I feel there's a kind of, there's a sort of internal coherence to what, to what she is, working on all the way through, um, which allows one to see her designs for the lampshades, her inventions as well, uh, the strange paintings of the 1930s, where she, as I understand it from um, Jennifer's very interesting essay, devised a, a new form of, of, of gesso or something. It's not just paint, it's, it's a kind of solid material that she was always looking for ways of combining materials to speak in some form, or at least certainly since the early drawings. Um, and and the, 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 this is following her own line, which, uh, which, which in a way, is, it's very difficult to link it to anything, um, of, of any very specific influences, except possibly Cornell. I mean, to go, one, one could look at, if I can find it, um, I mean, something like you know, snow crop and forgotten game. I mean, that, that you know, that there's a kind of dialogue between between um, abstract design and materials, which which you could see as as having something in, in common with him. Hmm. I hope that answers to an extent the question. 
Um, so actually there is extensive correspondence between Cornell and Loy sharing materials for each other's work. So they are involved with their actual process of each other. Um, but new, just in from the internet, uh, the Cornell show in Pasadena was after Mina died. It was in 1967. So that connection in California was not there for her. Dawn. Thank you again for your presentation. Can you hear me all right? Yes, I can. So, so you and to date, you and Jennifer Gross are the only art historians to have written about Mina Loy. And that's very recent. Do you think that your sorry? It's so sad. Yeah. Do you think that your do you think that your colleagues that, that, that fellow art historians are going to assimilate Mina Loy into the narrative of 20th century art and modernity? Or do you think having not been there for so long that it's gonna be more convenient just to continue to ignore her? What do you see in terms of art historians engaging with Mina Loy happening in the future now that this exhibition has taken place? Well, I, th I think a lot of art historians will have to revise their, uh, their, their views of these. I, mean, I, I, think, I think art historians are less addicted to isms now than they used to be. And so the, you know, the way it was difficult to write about somebody who was not a attached to a to a school or style of some kind is not quite so um, not quite so difficult. Um, I think the 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 the, the website what, what is it what is it called the, the Mina Loy Navigating um, Yes, which is excellent. Um, I find that you know there's plenty of art historical commentary there that I found extremely helpful. Um, so so uh, I think it I think clearly it needs more. I, I do think um, yes. I mean I, let, I, I find using the term modern is 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 tricky in her in, in relation to her. And I can see that, that that's sort of part of the debate at the moment, um, in a way, in terms of how art historians are are invited to look at her. Um, I don't know. I, I would hope that we kind of really see her with very fresh eyes and that she encourages us to look at things from, from if you like, um, unexpected perspectives. Dawn, thank you so much um, for, for your comments and um, Jennifer and Roger and Jennifer, thank you for your questions. Um, I wondered, um, well, first of all, I just want to say I agree with you that I think in light of what's now um, becoming visible about Mina Loy's career, I think we are going to have to revise certain narratives, um, even thinking, for example, about who might have seen the Bodley Gallery exhibition, um, which perhaps we haven't really sufficiently grappled with. But I wondered if we could um, bounce back to you the question that you raised um, about um, the exhibition um, on constructions. Why, or uh, uh, sorry, the art of assemblage, the site's exhibition. Do you have ideas about or suspicions about why Loy's work was not included by sites, um, who of course was keenly aware of what Duchamp was doing? Do you think there were particular dynamics at work that led, for, led to Loy's work not being picked up? I mean, it's very hard to answer, and, and there may be there may be material in the archive which would help us to to answer that question. Um, very few people were aware of what Duchamp was doing. I don't. I think that's in a sense um, uh, that that's not that's not directly relevant to why she got why she got left out. Um, what, what he what, nobody knew he was working on Etienne Donnet. At the time, no, nobody knew he was he was making this uh, this installation with with a, with, a, with a human figure. Um, but I, if you if you look at the catalogue of the art of assemblage, it it is it's it's most of it, a lot of it is really quite um, quite abstract in terms of the the objects maybe objects maybe ready mades or something, but they don't. Tell a story. I think something like Christ on the Clothesline would have been 
I mean, terribly shocking. <laughs> I think it would be really, really difficult to have shown that. Mm -hmm. um, although you could point to some, some sort of. I mean, I, I, I talk about possible, you know, the way one might compare it with George Cole's Christ in a gas, gas mask um, as, uh, for, for the kind of iconoclasm that it's working with. Uh, but but I I think. Um, I think it was sort of the social comment and the, you know, the strength of her feeling, uh, the fact that that she was not obviously turning this these materials into into sort of art in a, in a very sort of you know a sort of messy abstract way at all. She was telling a story of some kind. She wanted to make these figures make them become. I mean, bring people's attention. These these were overlooked figures who <laughs> nobody cared about. So I think I think there was something like that, that was just grating with the way that, broadly speaking, the the the, the, the art world was was actually considering itself at the time. That that's that's how I'm coming to see it. But I really I really don't know the answer. I think I think it's something that is we should go on looking at. I mean, Lee Bontaku, uh, who, who was mentioned by Roger. <laughs> She was included. A few women were. Louise Bourgeois wasn't. Um, but very few women were included. Were some. But I think I think it's I think it's an interesting area. I think I think in terms of how how Mina Loy has has been uh, forgotten and perhaps now beginning to be remembered, how that happened is linked to things like her exclusion from that exhibition. Mm -hmm. The art of assemblage. I think it's quite important. So I think we need to do more research on that, really. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Hi, Don. Um, just a, hello. How are you? Are you all right? Hi. Uh, so um, uh, I have a question for something that you have tantalizingly touched upon but didn't elaborate in relation to house hunting. Uh, so maybe it would be useful if you could go back to the slide with the house mm -hmm. hunting. Um, and I, uh, I'm actually prompted by the previous question which is about how what, what will be the next step for art historians? And it was quite remarkable that that, that particular construction, yeah, the, the one, yes, that one, thank you, um, that, that that got sudden visibility. Um, and, you know, the Venice Biennale, like Oscars, like all of these mm -hmm. other things, are very political affairs. So we all know that, that there is a response to Me Too and, and other matters here. But um, I'm just wondering, what your, you said there's plenty to say, uh, and I full, fully agree, I haven't started saying anything, so I would love to hear your initial thoughts on, on this piece, because you have been able to see it in person. And, and of course, we, we don't have the privilege of seeing it here, so, so for people in the room, um, uh, your thoughts on, on, on uh, house hunting would be valuable. Thank you. Well, um, I really need to go back to <laughs> to my notes for this, <laughs> Sonia. Sorry. Uh, yes, it, it, I mean it was. It was also. It was also a stunning piece. It wasn't. It wasn't shocking like Comil Cox is shocking. Uh, it, it's startling. It's quite grand. And of course, it was. It was bought by Peggy Guggenheim, and I think hung in her bedroom, as far as I, I, I recall the story going. Um, I mean, things. I mean, I. I, I think it, it's. It's full of. Full of symbols as well as references to her peripatetic life. We've actually moved from so many places. There are so many facades. There are different, actually, it's different sort of eras. It's not necessarily where she lived. It's different eras of dwellings from from the whole history of humanity in Europe, uh, if you like. Um, in the background, there's little there's little um, pieces of uh, little facades that she sticks on the background. Um, symbols like the, the 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 wonderfully dyed pieces of of of, of corn wheat that she has got uh, in place of rests, which of course is a reference to Ceres as uh, you know as a mother goddess of of um you, what, do you, what do you call it I mean, fruition if you like um, her hands are clasped. I don't know if you can see that actually. It's rather difficult to see on this slide, but the, the, she has clasped hands uh, between those little bits of wheat. 
Um, and she's gazing full face at you uh, and, and has these very strange sort of caryatids running down from the sort of balloon-like headdress hat that she's wearing, which itself is crammed with specific references to domesticity. Well, there are clothes on a clothesline, there are knitting needles, um, there's a little ladder. It's, it's, quite, it's quite miniature and very finely done, actually. So, so it's it's what it what it, what is it saying about her attitude to the situation of women? I mean that that would be my my question, and I think I would like to see that in relation to all her writing about women, which is quite extensive, of course, as you know, um, from the aphorisms on futurism to the Futures Manifesto and uh, many of her poems. Um, so. What are, what, are, what, are, what are women to do? I, I think house hunting, um, you know, uh, somebody who is, uh, who, who is without a base, without a home. Um, so I don't know whether it's expressing a kind of longing for, for a home or whether it's talking about the desire to be independent of the necessary sort of constrictions of feminine situation um it's it's it, it's and, and she she the, the the woman here is it's 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 very um it's very powerful she has a very strong presence so sorry i, I i'm I, i'm sorry what what do you think <laughs> i mean I, i'm just uh, listening and enjoying i mean every every insight and, and everything you have pointed out i'm i'm of course i'm, I'm very at, um, attracted to the crown piece which kind of cobbles together um uh, different facets of possibly domestic life but also i see the the kind of like a, almost like a bin and i see the clothesline and and i'm i was uh, intrigued when you commented on on um on these um, continuities in Loy's work that we can spot. And, and there is really a, even a, a figurative continuity in, in her interest in clothes being hung dry and, and people being hung dry and, and all, all of that uh, also playing in this, this late piece. So um, really a lot to, a lot to unearth, uh, but um, as you know, I'm working on home and modernism, and for me, this is a really uh, one of the quintessential embodiments of that kind of paradigm shift in thinking about home. So, uh, really interesting. I, I know that there are many more people to pose questions, but thank you for drawing our attention to this wonderful piece. Thank you. More yes, questions? Yeah. Yeah. This is a really quick question about the caryatids or earrings or whatever you would call them. Are they babies, those figures? That are hanging down when you saw them in person were you able to tell they look like human figures and maybe semi-naked babies well they are they are they are human figures i'm sorry i have to look look to the side to look at it in more detail um but they are the, the top ones have their arms up like caryatid yeah they are sort of who they are human babies who are they are who babies are, okay legs are wrapped around their wrapped around the shoulders yes exactly <laughs> I was thinking, I mean, because because the words the words are so close, very often in her in her poems and, and elsewhere, words meant a lot. To, I, I do think this phrase of being hung out to dry as as something you know, somebody being sort of sacrificed for somebody else's good um, is, is something that's in her mind when she has these clotheslines with clothes end up on. Them. Um, I'm, um, I'm so happy that Sonia and Suzanne um, have both sort of drawn our attention back to house hunting with you, Don, um, because I had the pleasure of hearing your talk at the Met last fall, which was just fabulous. And actually, when you showed this piece, um, something that occurred to me then and you know, has continued to sort of be shaping my thinking is the question of whether we might be able to consider house hunting something of a companion piece to Christ on a clothesline. And if it is in fact sort of almost like a pendant, I, I, I hesitate to use, to use the word portrait, um, except for that there do seem to be autobiographical elements of house hunting as you mention when we think about Mina's own 
identity. And the other thing that has been really interesting to me, um, and I unfortunately have not seen it in person either, um, but I can't help but um, be very fascinated by what I see is, as really interesting um, continuity between the iconography that's being developed in surreal scene and the imagery that we see here, especially with those sheaths of wheat and the, the naked exposed female figure. Um, and just thinking about perhaps metaphors of death and rebirth um, that might connect this, again, not only with the earlier surreal scene, but also themes that are implicit in Christ on a clothesline, which needless to say, obviously also features um, the clothesline so prominently. Um, yeah, yes, I mean, I, I, I very much like the idea that this could, could be a kind of um, companion piece to that. I, I, think, I think you can find s several instances of, of this, like the, the late works from Aspen, where I think there's sort of a male and female um, pairing, isn't there, which we talked about when you yeah. went round with it. Um, it it's it's the, the, the face is strange. I'm, I'm just thinking about, I mean, she, she's gazing, uh, gazing out at us as if she's in a trance. It's very pale and she's drawn almost more in the style that Tamina Law was using you know, back back in the 1910s. Uh, I mean, it's quite it, it's quite striking. But I do think that, that, that I mean that the, the hands crossed on the chest certainly uh, would be either a gesture of devotion or indeed death, because of course that, that's the way that tombs uh, I mean tombs show the dead figure. Uh, underneath um, the figure on top is shown with their hands crossed, just like that. So I do, I do think there's a, I mean, th there's a kind of sense of sacrifice there, actually. They're, they're precisely how I'm, I'm not quite sure. I mean, sacrifice and rebirth. I think death and rebirth is is part that, of it. Yeah. That goes with a series, isn't it? Um, because series Persephone is these are two two faces of 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 life, fertility, and death. Just following up on what you were saying, Donna, uh, and then this this would be a devotional gesture of of, of life and death, really, um, in in with the, with the corn uh, that is actually as if emerging from the crossed ha um, hands there. And then you can't help thinking that if 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 in that context, what does house hunting mean? Does it mean looking for I mean looking for a tomb? It's <laughs> looking you know, the tomb as a home. It's a different kind of home. So you, I mean, it, it does raise a really, a, a really different set of set of associations. Um, I just like for all for everyone's future reference to refer you to the Berenice Abbott photograph of this work rather than what we're looking at in front of us. So this work was when it was found by Carolyn Burke. It was very damaged, particularly the center panel, the figure. Um, there we go. Thank you. Thank you, yes. So um, a lot of the detail that's in the second figure, I think was trying to reach and achieve this. I mean, even the, you know, the, the sort of jaunty connection of the figure to the ground. Uh, I think all of the buildings maintained their physical, they're, they're quite remarkably intact, but all of the other elements I think have had to be reconstructed. So when you're, you're trying to understand the work to look at the Abbott photograph best. Um. I just wonder what you and anyone else might think about there being some humor in this piece. Um, because Loy was pretty witty and had a mean sense of humor in both senses of that world. So, I mean, I think there's just kind of a simple joke too that here's this female figure house hunting and yet she has a bubble of domesticity over her head and hanging from her head that cannot be, you know, that she seems to have to carry that weight along mm -hmm. with her even as she can't find a home, which seems like kind of a, a joke, an ironic joke. Um, <laughs> You know, I I I absolutely agree. <laughs> I think one can go too far along one route towards the, you know, towards the morbid, and and and, and there's undoubtedly so often a, a kind of a sense of humour. I mean, a, a sort of visual wit that, um, that just like in, in the poems, there's this extraordinary verbal ingenuity and and speed, 
I think that there's also a sense, can well be a sense of humour, which is the other one, the real sense of humour. Um, right. Yes. Yes, I think you're right. Well, um, apropos of your comment, Dawn, um, the hanging out the laundry to dry, I think there were many moments in motherhood that Mina did in fact feel a little hung out to dry. It wasn't just the bums in, in the drinking um, in the Bowery, but she felt a little hung out in, in terms of her responsibilities as a mother. I'm sorry, I couldn't, I couldn't really hear that properly. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Just to confirm, like your earlier statement of reading the clotheslines as being hung out to dry, I think that doesn't move us too far off from her experience of motherhood. <laughs> right. Anyway, her, herself being felt she'd been hung out to dry. Yes, a little bit, yeah, perhaps. Sorry, sorry? Yes, perhaps. Yes, yes, perhaps. Well, I mean, yes. Um, which, I mean, she, I, th I think obviously one, you know, that you've got this presumably, I mean, tension always for her between trying, I mean, needing because she wanted to be independent to an extent and uh, earn enough to keep herself and her daughters um, in alive um, and wanting to be free and completely independent and without them. So I think obviously there's a uh, some ways, I imagine fraught relationship, but then I, I mean, Roger, you, you've, you've met, um, met the daughters, so you will know much more about the, uh, what their sense of being mothering, being mothered was like. Yeah, that's a complicated, very, very to get into. And that's not the same for each of them. You know, that each daughter had her very particular relationship with their mother, her mother. So, um, and it was defined partly by their difference in age. And therefore, the difference in domicile and city that they had their formative years growing up in. But this gets us into the realm of psychoanalysis. I don't know how much more time we have now. But, but, um. Great. Um, thank you. 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 Thank